If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I am glad to welcome somebody here. Rick Lop. And those of you who actually watch the Sabati videos, and if you didn't, please go and do so. They're very much worth your while to look at. You will know that Rick Lop was in Free to Battalion's Ricky Wing. But he didn't start there. Like most of us, he, he came to the army, I suppose, through national service. Now, Rick, is that true? Where do you come from? How did you end up in foresight? Thank you, Chris. Um, I, uh, <coughs> I grew up on a small farm outside PE. My dad was a businessman. My mother was a housewife. She made the best um, yellow homemade butter you could ever wish to eat. Uh, it was dairy that we had there, and I, I grew up there. <coughs> After school, I was deferred for a year for some reason or other. I don't know why, but I was deferred. So I worked on the farm for a year. And then in, in uh, January 97, I boarded a train for Middleburg, uh, Forsyth, Middleburg. That's where we all clawed in. They cut our hair short. I had a beard, so they cut me half beard and half hair. And I walked around there for a while <laughs> like that. And of course, everybody laughed, but it was fine. And eventually they chaved it off and we did the standard admin claw in, getting our browns, all that stuff. We went to a big hall one of the mornings. And I remember they were asking people to write down their names and their details. And some of the guys there couldn't even write that. I was astounded. I couldn't believe it. But yes, we had some guys that couldn't read or write. Anyway, we did a few weeks there at um, Forsai. And <clears throat> they selected some of us to go and do the junior leaders course down at Oatswin. And I thought that's a buck cut idea. It's near home. So I went. Um, and yeah, I, fi I figured, why not? You know, it's something different. And let's make the most of the army. And um, we boarded a train after a week or two, three at Middleburg, and we went off down to uh, Oatswaran. Uh, we arrived in Oatswaran, I think it was around about 9, 10 in the morning from, uh, from Middleburg. And of course, the shouting started. Eh? Three on, two, and this and that. And now we realized, whoa, we're in Middleburg, yeah. Oh, sorry, we're in Oatswaran, yeah, it's infantry school. Um, I was uh, put into the PF company, which was HQ company, under a Captain Stain from uh, one para, one para, and our sergeant major, our company sergeant major was a guy called Kutsia. Short little guy, stocky, nice man, very strict, but very fair. Uh, my, my, platoon, my platoon commander was a guy called Lieutenant Kutsia. He was a teacher. And our sergeant was a tough bloke called um, Sergeant Kruger. He was a really, a, he was a proper sergeant. You know what I mean? He was a PF guy and he was, he was a sergeant. Anyway, um, we carried on. We, you know, we started with our junior leaders uh, course. And um, during my training at Otsu, and I was very privileged to do well at shooting. And I got awarded my silver uh, Skit Bulky, which is a first class, uh, sorry, a second class uh, shot, uh, marksman. And I was proud of that because there weren't too many of those around. I also had the unfortunate incident of having a bayonet go through my foot while we were playing um, Weitzbien, which in English is uh, leggy leggy. I don't know if anybody knows that game, but you throw a knife or something and you might you put your foot there and, that, and you make the guy go wider anyway wider and wider and then <coughs> whoever wins wins but yeah this oak threw this bayonet and it went through my boot and into my foot they wanted to claw us on the skardagan fund states aimed them you know damaging a state's property but something happened and they didn't but i i had to carry on with training and it was aina anyway we we made it and no problem a bit of a funny thing happened to me when we did Fussbate 5 in the Swartberg Mountains. Um, every second day or so, they would, <clears throat> they would, the leader group would come to you and they'd 
give you a whole lot of tins, unmarked tins. And you chose a tin and whatever was in that tin, you ate it. If you wanted to share with somebody, that was your decision. And you won't believe it, but every single time I chose a tin, I either got a water lemon confit or tomati confit. Look, I don't, eat, I don't eat those things, you know, anyway. <laughs> and nobody wanted to share with me. <laughs> So yeah, I was quite hungry after that finished. Um, we had snow during fast bait five. And it was quite a tough fast bait five, but we all made it and it was an interesting experience. Um, and we carried on with our junior leaders, the normal stuff, you know, running around, making, digging in that hard oats and sand or soil. <laughs> anyway, in October, in early October, I think it was, um, uh, the units from the SADF came to Oatswin to recruit um, leader group, junior leaders for the various units. And you had units like one para, you had units like Rickies and engineers, well, I don't know, uh, dog squad, bike squad, horse squad, all those guys came. And the people that were interested in those various um, activities would go and listen to the you know, what they presented, and then they would obviously sign up for the next year. Anyway, I, <clears throat> I saw that these two people standing on the parade ground, and the one guy was very imposing. And um, he was, his name was Aris M. Pep van Sel. And next to him was standing um, Commandant Falcon Ferreira. Anyway, I thought, yes, what, what is this? I wanted to go to special forces or paramedics. That was what my, um, my idea was going to be. And in fact, I must just remind you, I'm going to say something now, which I should have said before. During Oats, when I let it slip, when we were in Oshavelo doing coin op phase, Oshavelo in Southwest Africa, I let it slip to my sergeant that I wanted to join the special forces or the paramedics. Oh, oh, big mistake. Ever since I told him that, at any opportunity, he would tell me, through, can a box of ammo. And I had to pick up this ammo box and I had to run with it all over the show. While the guys were having rest and smokes, I had to run with this ammo box. In the sand, in the heat, hey man, and I couldn't understand why this O was doing this to me. But when we got back to Otsuan, he made me pick a big rock and that rock stayed with me for the whole time until I clawed out. And ever I went, I had to carry this rock. <laughs> anyway, that's, so that was that, and um, I, I signed on. I heard uh, Commandant Ferreira and Pep and Sale talking briefly about this Unit 32 Battalion, and I thought, no, I think I'll join them. That sounds exciting. So I signed up. <clears throat> we had a little, um, we had a little uh, interview kind of thing with both of them, and then they they selected who they wanted to join, and off, and we were we were signed up. They sent us away for a long weekend, came back to Oetzoren. Um, <clears throat> the people that were joining 3-1 Battalion and 3-2 Battalion and maybe one or two other units jumped on the Flossy and we flew up to Rundu all the way from Oetzoren to, uh, to Rundu. Uh, we arrived at Rundu, I remember it was around about 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in, in the afternoon. And when the back of that Flossy opened, the heat hit us. We, yeah something else, you know, when you're not used to it. And uh, we were met by um, RSM Pep, who welcomed us and formed us up and walked us off the tarmac straight into the, the HQ of C2 Battalion, which was on just off the tarmac on the, on the, on the runway. Inside the, uh, the HQ, it was quite nice, you know, it was neat and tidy and uh, they had nice things there like tea and you know and all that stuff nice offices and we were all put on the, in the outside in, in a small little garden and uh, Pe um, Pep you know, proceeded to explain to us the steps and um, then Colonel uh, Commandant Ferreira came and he explained to us about the unit um, we they obviously didn't tell us everything at Oatswin because there was a lot of people there that didn't join up so when we got to the, the HQ, they started telling us more and more and more. 
and yeah, we, you know, we did the, we did some admin work with, um, with one of the sergeant majors there, Rosa, sergeant major Rosa, also a great guy, <clears throat> fortunately he's passed away now, but yeah, we did all that, and then I'd say at about two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, we, the Queerfuls came, a Queerful is a armored proof, um, big Magiris truck, and the Queerfuls came, and we all jumped on the Queerfuls, and we started the trip back to Buffalo Base on the dusty road, going east into the Caprivi. And we were about three, four hours later, <coughs> we arrived at the base uh, of, of Buffalo. Very imposing entrance, big brick, big stone, two big stone walls with Buffalo and the 3-2 battalion, Buffalo Corp mounted on there, MP standing at the gate. And we drove into the base, down through the bush and around and then to the, what they called the Manasi, which is the mess area. The admin area and the mess area were all together. Um, if, if I'm correct, that's where we stood, that's where we first came in. Uh, we all bailed off there. We clawed into the base. I can't remember who was there to uh, to assist us, but it was one of the senior NCOs and an officer. Um, uh, we clawed into Buffalo. Uh, they drove us down to the lines. Now the lines where the troops all lived, everybody lived there was probably about two kilometers down, uh, right along the river. The, 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 the living quarters were right along the river, river and they, the, the leader group people lived in little writ in, um, reed and, uh, reed and um, steel roofed houses, which were made for them by the troops with lots of mos mosquito netting because obviously it was hot there. So the more draft you get, the cooler you are. But we stayed in tents. Us new recruits, we stayed in tents. I would think all in all, we must have been about 75 to 80 people, new recruits. They put us all in tents and we walked up to the mess for supper and it was just, it was very imposing. I mean, you saw all these guys walking around. They were friendly, but they were a little bit aloof. You know, they stayed away. And, and yeah, we, I, was, I was amazed. I was totally in awe. And I knew this is where I wanted to stay. And I was going to go all out to make sure that I made it. <clears throat> anyway, we had a lovely supper, and I think we were allowed to have a beer or two each. And then we went back to the lines, and we slept. We woke up, we, and then started the, the whole 3-2 kiering, if you can, or selection. We did a week's acclimatization where we did a little bit of conversational Portuguese. Um, we did a little bit of history of the unit. Um, you know, they showed us a few foreign weapons, you know, just to make it interesting. The climatization period, as I say, was about five days to a week. And then after that, <clears throat> the instructors told us, ready for selection, it's coming up any day now. And the, 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 the signal for form up was two shots in the air, bang, bang, with a, with a rifle or a pistol or whatever it was. And then you had to form up in a squad as quickly as you can. And they, so yeah, that's what we were doing. Anyway, one night after dinner, we all went back to the tents and we were busy sleeping or whatever. And I think it must've been 10 o'clock that night, bang, bang, grabbed our kit, formed up. And the instructor said, uh, Pep, was <laughs> Pep was there, Jim Ross was there. Um, Shaul Muller was standing there and there were a couple of, I mean, you could see they'd had a couple of uh, rums and coke and they were really um, raring to go now. And they said, gentlemen, selection starts now. And they marched us off about a 500 meters to a kilometer away to the troops mess. And there it started. They strip, strip searched us, took all the luxuries we had out away, cigarettes, sweets, chewing gum, Anything of luxury was taken away. <clears throat> and of course, you would chase around, told to do push ups, sit ups. Um, they, they issued us with two rounds each per person, and they just uh, messed us around for the whole night. They would 
like things like that say, go and get a stick this long, that thick, that quickly, go. And you say, how long, how thick, you don't know how, and it's into the dark, you run into the bush, you don't know how, where, or how thick, how long the stick is. It's just to mess you around and keep you awake. Anyway, when, uh, when the sunrise started coming, then they blindfolded us and they put us on a, on, a, on a truck and they took us somewhere. They dropped us off and they said, right, here's your map, here's your compass, uh, orientate yourself and your next RV is, and they gave us a grid, a, a, a grid reference and we had to get there within a certain time. I don't remember all the different RVs, but we, this is what they did to us for the next five days. Um, I do recall <clears throat> at one of the RVs, I think it was on the third or fourth day, I was really like a mook and I got there, our stick had got in early. So I was sitting against a tree, just resting. And during selection, if an officer or an NCO walks past, you don't have to jump up and strike him. You can, you can just acknowledge him by striking your arms forward. And RSM Pep walked past me and he said, Ja, Engelsman, who can it And uh, so I said, good, and I slept him, and uh, I'm very scared of him, you know. Uh, and the next minute he walked off, but as he walked off, he tossed me something, and it, in my lap was a cigarette. Now, if they caught you smoking on, on selection, you were immediately off the course. Anyway, he threw me the cigarette, and he looked like, I didn't know what, I thought, geezy, what's this, man? And anyway, I held it. I wasn't going to say to him, RSM, you know, this is yours. I just kept quiet and I held it. I kept it because he didn't walk, he didn't look back. I saw it came from him. He walked past me again and he threw me a half a match and a, a little bit of flint. So now I had <clears throat> everything to smoke. Hey, I didn't know what to do. I was severely worried. I was, I thought this is an ambush. RSM Pep's ambushing me. And, you know, he wants me off. Anyway, I kept this, but you know, after you hadn't smoked, smoked for a few days and you're a smoker, you really list to smoke. Anyway, my friend and I smoked that cigarette late that night and boy, we enjoyed it. And it was, nothing was ever mentioned about that cigarette ever again by Pep. So I don't know, it was, <laughs> it was just a very weird experience and something that I'll never forget as long as I live. Anyway, we carried on with the, um, the selection and uh, we got to, on the fifth day, we, on the fifth day, we got to an RV, which was fairly near Omega Base. Omega Base was about 30 kilometers to the east of Buffalo. And uh, we slept the night there. And the instructors told us uh, that the, 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 the queer fools will, will be here tomorrow morning. And we thought, yes, this is the end. We made it. This is great stuff. But yeah, uh, it wasn't quite to be that way because the trucks did, did arrive, certainly. And on the back of the trucks, there was hot boxes with, with lack of hot course. You know, um, um, if I remember correctly, it was Pup and um, Shrapnel and, um, and Budavos. Shrapnel is uh, chopped up onion and tomato, but it's very nice. It's lacquer. And pup is, I don't know, it's like a stave up pup, you know what I mean? I don't know what's it in English. But anyway, that was what it was, and it was really nice to, see, to get food after, after six, five, six days without it. Look, we did get little bits of food, like we'd get one egg maybe, and maybe a rusk made with, um, made with uh, um, uh, malaria pills. So it was so bitter you could hardly eat it, and coffee with salt in it, that kind of stuff. You know, you, you did get food, but it was edible but not really edible so when this came along and they said to us the instructor said boys you can eat as much as you want yo uh, something something just said hold back here eat something but don't go mad and of course there were cokes and stuff as well so we could drink the cokes and eat the food i did eat some i, I have to i had to because i was so angry but i didn't over indulge and after that, that we packed everything up onto the trucks. We climbed on the vehicles. We thought, yep, we're going back to Buffalo now. Not to be. Um, a while after we left there, we saw a truck standing in the road. And <clears throat> we stopped. He told us to climb out and form up. And he said to, he said to us, we said to somebody, I can't recall who it was, 
gaan kyk op die trok wat wacht vir jou maaikies. So, go, and, go and look on that truck and, and tell your friends what's, what's waiting for them there. And one of the guys jumped off and he had a look and he came back and he said, it's poles. No, everybody sighed and then we realized, no, selection's not over. Anyway, the sticks had to choose a pole and we had to go. And there we had to go. I don't know. I think it, we've talked about this. We don't know how far it was away from Buffalo, but it was probably it was probably 10 to 15 k's away from Buffalo with poles and all our kit and the 81 canister filled with cement and all that stuff. And you know, you really thought it was over, and now you get saddled with this. Well, there was a there was a lot of guys eh, that actually gave up right there and then. They said, "No, this is not for me anymore. I'm out of it." And we lost quite a few guys there right there and then, and it actually was the end because when we got to Buffalo, it was the end of the selection. And <clears throat> we, uh, my smoothie and myself, my stick guy that was left with me, yeah, he was also a PE guy, and rest in rest his God rest his soul in peace. Uh, he died. Uh, he, but anyway, at Smoothie and I, we got into the base at about four o'clock in the afternoon and we went down to the river and we had a nice bath in the river and clean clothes and then we walked up to the mess and there we had a nice meal and some beers and the selection was over. Um, I cannot recall what happened the next few days, but the guys that were RTU'd all left and us uh, of the 80 odd or 75 up to 80 odd that started the selection only 25 to 30 of us were left i can't recall the exact figure but we all think it's around about 25 to 30 guys made it then <coughs> then we were taken down to kelly's triangle which was a training area close to the botswana border also along the river very wild all the wild animals you could even say, ever think of were, were there. Elephant, rhino, oh no, sorry, elephant, hippos, crocodiles, lion. There was leopard there, there was cheetah there, there was sable, antelope, buffalo. There were, it was unbelievable, the animals in, in that place. But anyway, we went there and we started doing the formal 3 2 battalion training, which was um, um, foreign weapons, advanced medical, um, nav advanced ma uh, navigation, um, basic minor tactics, um, ambush drills, basic demolitions, you know, those the sort of courses, signals, um, ra different radios, and all that we started doing. And of course, fire and movement, and you know, the normal military training, but just on a bit of a higher level now. We all lived in, in, in little TBs in a circle. And the instructors lived in tents. They could bra whatever they wanted to. You know, we, we lived like we lived in the bush. And we, if we needed water, we had to sneak off at night to the river and go and get the water and bring it back. And, that, and the instructors took great delight in laying bushes for us, uh, fuckle, you know, the flares, you know, that you knock. And if they catch you, then they punish you. So it was, it was quite... Uh, it was quite a learning curve for a lot of us. We stayed there for a month, or I think a month, three weeks to a month, uh, working with the instructors. The instructors that, that we had there, and the guys in three two will remember the names. They were, they were guys like um, Zach Garrett, Gavin Mon, Jim Ross, um, Opis Opperman, Russell Organ. Um, I think Charles Muller came down a few times and trained us a bit. Um, RS, uh, RS and Pep came down, and so there was, you know, we had good training from solid soldiers, I mean, from solid guys. Gavin Fienstra was another one, um, Franz Fourie, who ended up in four recce, he, he came and trained us. So, yeah, it was solid training, good, good soldiers, honored people, legends that trained us. After that, we, uh, we went back to Buffalo and we were. We went to the QM stores where we drew our, our first lot of camis. Uh, we, we, we drew winter camis and summer camis. Uh, they issued us with AK rifles. And of course, we always had our R1s with us. And 
we got space ops kit, what they call space ops kit, a little uh, military, uh, you'll know it from um, um, the course living in Switzerland, is what they call the Swiss op, a Swiss ops knife. It was a little red knife with a white cross on it. We each got issued one, one of those. Anyway, we got the space ops kit and we were deployed. Well, we got the machila, which was a proper rucksack, H-frame rucksack. And we were deployed into Southern Angola for the Christmas time period. A lot of the companies came out and we went in. Um, our company, I think we were only 15 guys and there was another company of 15 guys. If I remember correctly, the other com uh, company, the other platoon was, uh, platoon commander was a guy called Brahm. Anyway, uh, Lieutenant Brahm and our, our platoon was, uh, platoon leader was a, was a guy by the name of Saro Kruger. Legend, absolute legend. He ended up in one recce and unfortunately he died in a parachuting accident. Both his, both his brothers were in 3-2 battalion. Excellent people. Anyway, yeah, we did our Christmas in the bush and we came back to Buffalo and then we were allocated to our various um, platoons and companies. And um, much to my happiness, I was chosen myself and Smoothie, again, my friend from Port Elizabeth, Smoothie were chosen to join the recce group. And boy, that was... It was like a dream come true. I never expected it, and yeah, I was seriously honoured. You know, so yeah, I was part of the Ricky group, and I don't recall too much what happened. Of course, after that, whether we, whether I left Buffalo <coughs> and went back to and went to Omahoni with Smoothie, I, I cannot recall. I cannot recall it. Is there anything that you would like to ask me, perhaps? No. Oh. You're doing so well here, Rick. Thank you. Um, I have to remind the audience, we were talking about 42 years ago. You, you know, you, you cannot blame a man if he can't recall absolutely everything. I'm astonished at how, how much you people actually do remember. And I have to say also the Kruger brothers, Kruger, as we call him in Afrikaans, we have him lined up for an for okay. episode here. Okay. Uh, maybe in a month or two from now, but just keep on watching. I just want to ask you quickly, Rick, um, how is M. Pep von Sale? We're going to make an episode on him as well. He's unfortunately late now. But everybody I spoke to is just speaks of this man like with so much awe. Can you tell me a little bit of him? What, what impressions he had on you and how did he form you as a young soldier? Of course. Um, yeah, sure, of course. Well, look, um, uh, Pep. Marisim Pep, he, he was just, um, he was just an, an incredible, his presence was, was just incredible. I mean, yeah, he, he had the most piercing blue eyes that you've ever seen in your whole life. If he looked at you, I, um, it was like they were piercing straight through you. And it's almost like he would look into your soul. But and he was a he was a fair uh, I mean he was he was a fair guy he was a, but he was he was tough and he was but he was no I just I can't explain it because he was just he was one of those people that if he told you to run into a fire you would have done it you know he, he was just one of those people he was really a leader a leader amongst men um yeah you know, there, there's an urban legend that goes around um Sergeant Major Pippin Sale. And I've only heard this from hearsay, so, but it's, it's actually, I think it's a story which honors the fairness of, of, this, of this great legend. And it goes like this, um, two sergeants came back from operations and they walked into the NCO's bar and in the corner, on the left-hand side, underneath the dartboard sat Sergeant Major Pep, quietly sipping on his rum and coke, saying nothing, quietly there. Anyway, the two sergeants were after supper, they wanted more beers and more beers and wanted to carry on having a party. And uh, totally the barman rang the, rang the bell last round. Hey, and these, these two sergeants said, never, ever, you keep in this bar open. We want to drink. We want to drink. And so anyway, with that, Pep made his presence known. And he said, yeah, 
He said, do you guys want a drink? He said, finish all your drinks, you guys that, that are left here. The two sergeants, you stay here, Polly. And everybody left the pub and the two sergeants remained in the bar with Sergeant Major Pip and Sodal. He said to Tolly, Tolly, three bottles of red hot rum and six Cokes. Now, a Coke came in a little can, a, a, I don't know, what is it? 250 mils, 300 mils of Coke. And the two sergeants were delighted until Cokes ran out. And Tolly was sent back to the lines and the two sergeants sat, sat with Pep drinking rum and Coke with two Cokes. <laughs> The two cokes finished, and they and Peps and Francel made them stay until they finished their rum. Now you must know that these guys, after a whole bottle of rum, they was geslinger. They were geslinger, and he, they begged him. It was late, late, late. It was early in the morning, in fact. This is how the, the legend goes. But it, and the, these two sergeants begged Pep if they could borrow his his bucky, uh, his his Gary, to go back to the lines. And he said, Yeah, yeah, you can use it. Just make sure it's in, on the parade ground at, at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. They took the, uh, the Sergeant Major Pip's uh, Gary, and he had the neatest Gary in the whole of in the whole of the army, as only Pip could do. It blinked, everything worked. The mirrors were all there. Nothing was cracked. It worked. It was an RSM's Gary. It worked. Anyway, these two mad sergeants got onto the um, parade ground where they started to do handbrake turns and driving around and being reckless with this Bucky and uh, this Gary and doing all sorts of stupid things with it. And to cut, to make it even worse, they, they, a madness struck them and they kicked everything that was glass broken. His front window screen, his mirrors. Oh. Anyway, the next morning, eight o'clock, his Gary was on the parade ground. These two sergeants had hijacked a driver and, they, and it's told him, take this thing to the parade ground and leave it there. Sergeant Major came and saw his Gary that was damaged and he said nothing. Nothing. Two, three days went by, nothing was said. That These two sergeants never came near the mess. They ate rat packs in the lines. After about the third day, he sent a message down to the lines with somebody. He told Sergeant A and Sergeant B, they better be here tonight for supper. I need to see them. Anyway, yeah, they, were, they were up there. They, and instead of coming in civvies, they came in their browns, with, you know, with their arrays on and all that. And he wasn't there when they got there. So they had a two, one or two very quiet beers. And they ate their supper. And just after supper, just before Tolly was going to ring the bell for final round, in walked Pep. Yes, he would. There was a bombshell of guys out of that pub because they all knew it was coming. <laughs> and the two sergeants stood there. And Pep chased everybody out the mess. And he said to Tolly, Tolly, six cokes and three bottles of red hot rum. And you sergeants, tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, my Gary will be on the parade ground and every single bit of glass that you broke will be repaired. And then he made them drink another bottle of red hot rum and they had to fix his Gary. And you know what? They did it. <laughs> they stole from somebody else's Gary and they made it. <laughs> and they made it happen. <laughs> but that's the kind of man Pip was. He was, I mean, you can't get more fair than that. You know? It's, it's fantastic to me that he was, of course, a Special Forces qualified man. Yeah, yeah. And he became, I think, the RSM of Special Forces, he might have been, or one of the regiments, perhaps. I might be wrong. But three, two battalions speaks highly of him. Special Forces speaks highly of him. So it must have been just the way he was, a natural leader. Yeah. No, of course, definitely. I am, you know, he also had the ability to, to remember people um, very, very well. I mean, years, I'm talking years after I'd clawed out of 3-2. And I mean, Pip wasn't our RSM for my whole time while I was there. He was only RSM of 3-2, I think up until April, February, March, April of 1980. 
and then he moved over. He moved back to to one as 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 RSM. I think you're right. He was RSM or one Ricky. And there he stayed. And um, in about 84, 85, um, I went up to Durban with a friend who was also in the unit with me. And we decided to go and visit Pep. And this friend of mine was a, just a normal driver, but he, he did a lot of work. He was there a year before me. So he worked with Pep continuously. In fact, he, he he helped to build the, the, the officer's mess at Buffalo, the, this, this um, driver friend of mine. So Pep knew him intimately. And we went and visited him on the bluff on our way back to PE. And he remembered us. He, he did. He didn't even say, what's your name here? He said, yeah, the Engelsman. He knew me, the Engelsman that was in the recce group. And he knew Nico Hunderwald, the guy that was the, the driver for him. You know, that kind of, you know, so that shows you what kind of a leader he was. He just... Awesome man, uh, really a guy that you go to to war with. Yeah, yeah. You were at Reiki Group. Was Franz for you in charge, or was it uh, Willem Rotter? Uh, of course, uh, Franz for you was in charge of the Reiki Group until uh, Willem Rotter arrived, and then Franz went to do um, special forces selection, and then he. And when he came back, of course, Willem was already in the unit. So then France left for special forces. But no, France definitely ran the recce group while Willem was still not there. Yeah. Yes, and Willem himself is, uh, <clears throat> I believe, was Rhodesian SAS. So yes, he, he was also special forces. I'm trying to, to tell the reader here what was happening with the recce wing. Why did 3 2 Battalion need a recce wing while you actually had special forces doing the same type of work? In a different, no, not even a different way. France for reset, it's the same. Uh, can you just tell us about Ricky Wing? Why, why did you need that? Okay, of course. Um, yes, that's a very important question, and thanks for, for that. Yeah, um, the Ricky the Ricky Wing was was started by um, uh, Gen, um, Commandant Gert Nell, uh, who was the, the OC of the unit before Falcon uh, Ferreira, and the recce capability came about because special forces at that time were doing bits and pieces of work for 3 2 battalion for the companies. And it, it, the, the, because of the shortage of manpower that they had at special forces, it was decided by uh, um, Commandant Nell at the time to develop their own reconnaissance capabilities. That was how the 3-2 the recce wing came about. The training was not nearly as advanced as uh, special forces training. The jobs we did were not nearly as difficult as special forces did, but we did very similar work as, we, as they did. I mean, I'm going to tell you now later about some of the operations which I was involved in, and I was only in the recce group for a year. So yeah, the, it was it was a very important um, capability that that was desperately needed by three two battalion to, to to do their to do their own work, and as a result, um, there was there was a selection. There was an invitation given to the original three two recce guys, and if I if I remember correctly, I think maybe ten or twelve of them passed that selection and became the initial recce group wing for 3-2 Battalion. And of course, one of those was Franz Fourri. Um, just off the top of my head, the original guys were people like Zach Garrett, Chris Poole, um, Tians Marais, um, Piet van Eerden, um, Gavin Fienstra, unfortunately, he passed away. Daisy Lopesha, Fritzy Fritz Gerald, uh, Boats, Lieutenant Boats, <laughs> Oppies Opperman. So, yeah, I, 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 please forgive me if I've left somebody out. But, and Pitt, of course, geez, how did I forget? Pitt, Pitt Norkia was also um, one of the originals. Um, so, yeah, the, yeah, those were the original guys. And then that's why I, I, was, I was absolutely amazed when they selected me to, to, to join them. But obviously, they, 
I, they had something that, that that they liked, and yeah, they they chose me. So I was I was very 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 blessed, if I can call it that, to be part of them. That was a dream come true. But that's how the capability of well, that's how three two battalion recce, recce wing came about. After after I was selected by the recce group to join them, I cannot recall much, but I do know that it was not long after I'd been selected to join them, there was there was an operation, there was a, a, a clandestine CSI managed operation undertaken by 3-2 Battalion for UNITA once again, or not once again, as normal. And the operation involved um, taking over a base on the border of Southwest Africa and Angola um, at a place called Derico. Derico was, um, Derico was, had a FAPLA presence there and they were supporting Swapo in a big way. As well, there was, there was fear that um, they would attack Jamba, which was, north, which was north of them. And Jamba was the, it was the uni, UNITA base where Jonas Savimbi had his base. So CSI thought it would be a good idea to take that base and you know, not allow you know, troops, FAPTA troops to, to be present there. Anyway, we, uh, the, the companies practiced um, river crossing with the troops and that didn't go down very well because I remember talking to somebody about it and they were saying that the, the boats were so, there wasn't a big freeboard, meaning you know, there, there wasn't a lot of distance between the top of the, of the boat and where you sat. So when the, when the boats were, had a lot of troops in them, there was a good chance that the water would come in and sink the boat. And of course, those rivers are, are croc infested and there's, there's crocodiles in those rivers that you can't believe. Where they practiced crossing, river crossing with these boats and the troops deployed to the dispersal point to, to go across the river to attack Derico. And it was told to uh, Commandant Ferreira that they thought that the FAPLA had got wind of this and they'd gone. So instead of sending the troops across to go and attack an empty base, he needed to know what was going on. So he, 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 ordered, he ordered us to go, he ordered the recce group to go and have a look. And I was chosen for that op and it was my first, very first operation with, as, a, as in the recce group. And the, the guys that went was a chap called Don, Captain Don Delaray. Don De La Rey worked for CSI. He was a captain. He, he was an X32 guy as well. And I think he knew that base like the back of his hand. So it was Captain Don De La Rey, Lieutenant Zach Garrett, Lieutenant Smoothie Baumeister, and myself. Um, unfortunately, Smoothie developed a serious issue with his teeth just before we were supposed to be deployed, and he couldn't come with us. So the three of us went. And that evening across the river, they took us at Zodiacs across the river and we went, made our way silently up the hill towards Derico. We entered the base and there, there were definitely troops there. There weren't many, but there were troops there and they were snoring and, you know, and we were walking around. Don De La Rey was slowly but surely trying to take the working parts of a 14-5 out. And the next minute, one of the sleeping people shouted, chaos, chaos, which means who's there, who's there? And of course, we took off. Um, we'd been compromised and we took off. We ran southeast down the hill and they started shooting at us. But they didn't know where we were. We could see from the traces, but we took off anyway and we ran like hell down the hill and we started anti tracking. We anti tracked for, for as long as we could, right up until. Um, sunrise and a little bit even longer than sunrise and we found a, a layup for the day and we lay we lay there waiting and the, the rest of that day we could hear the troops the fucked troops looking for us fortunately they never found us but it was quite nerve-wracking i must say to lie there and hear them all around us anyway they never found us and then later that night the zodiacs came across and we ex exfiltrated back to uh, southwest africa i reckon 
that if there were no crocs in that river, I think we would have swum across that river that same night. But there was no chance that any of us were going to take a, take a risk with those crocodiles. So yeah, that was that was my first operation with the Reiki group. Um, any questions uh, at all, Chris? You want me to? Yes. Um, I'm sure that people will want to know what is CSI. Let's start with that. CSI is Chief Staff Intelligence. Um, they worked, they worked, they were South African part of the South African military, but they worked directly with with UNITA and um, who were our allies at the time. So yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned who they were, of course. I beg your pardon. Yeah, that's a CSI. Okay, now I want to ask, when you go over the river like that, are you dressed like the enemy or are you in South African army clothes? Oh no, sorry, are we? No, we, we, we dressed in, in camouflage, uh, unmarked camouflage um, gear. Um, you know, totally unmarked stuff. No South African markings at all, nothing. And they would obviously know South African if they had to catch us because we're white, you know. So, but yeah, we, we dressed in camis and special ops kit. I was carrying the B-52 radio for, um, for, for, for communications. And um, Zach and um, Don were using the small um, HF radios for, but we didn't need them. You know, there was no need, need for them at all. Yeah, that, that, that's all. Uh, that's that's what it is. And of course, our AKs we carried. And we, you could have a choice between carrying an R1 or an AK, but most of the guys preferred an AK. It, it was more reliable. It, you know, it was lighter. Um, and yeah, it was it was a good weapon for the bush. Okay, thank you. No, <laughs> it, it's an exciting life. Well, I'm listening. <laughs> thank you, of course. Oh, the next operation um, with the Reiki group um, was um, we did a bridge blowing operation once again at the Rico. This was again um, a CSI controlled operation, so it didn't have a name. No, it wasn't Ops ABC, it was because it was run by CSI, Chief Staff Intelligence. And that was again. Uh, to, to drop the bridge because of the same reasons, um, the, the threat of, of an attack to Jamba, which is the UNITA uh, stronghold base, and also the, um, the mobility of, 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 of Swapa and, and MPLA up and down that road, supplying people, et cetera, et cetera. So CSI decided that it was imperative that this, this bridge gets dropped. Anyway, we, uh, we ended up, the Ricky team ended up back at Buffalo and we, Willem joined us. That's right, Willem came and joined us. And yes, it's such a long time ago, but he, Willem had joined us by then and, and um, we got a nice surprise the one day. He, um, uh, um, a Gary arrived and on the back of the Gary, there was a couple of bundles, you know, uh, bags. There was a couple of bags, gray bags on this thing. And anyway, he, we took them off and he said, yeah, boys, now we've got something interesting here. And we, and he, we, we emptied them and, and it was, it was um, canvas and wood frames. We had no idea what this was. Anyway, to cut a long story short, it was what they call a klepper. A klepper is a canoe which um, the SBS, a Special Boat Service, used during the war um, in England to infiltrate harbors, et cetera, et cetera, and blow up boats and that sort of thing. And these canoes are absolutely astounding. They're still, to this day, the same canoes that, that they used in the Second World War. But they are quite difficult things to get to understand and to know. So the next couple of days, Willem spent time with us, teaching us. You see, him having been in the SAS, he, uh, in the Rhodesian SAS, he he, he knew these boats. He'd used them plenty up there. So he, he had firsthand experience in operating with, with, these, with, these, with this type of equipment. The next couple of days he spent instructing us uh, to assemble and disassemble and assemble and disassemble these canoes. He even blindfolded us uh, and made us do it. 
And my partner um, in this, on this operation was a bloke called Sergeant Daisy Lobsher, a tall guy, great guy, lacquer oak. Um, me and him uh, learned how, how to do this, and we did it well. We, we, we got to the bottom of it, and we, we actually started doing it fairly quickly and fairly you know, um, efficiently. We got to know the boats, then of course we had to row them up and down the rivers, getting used to how they, how they, you know, how they maneuver. Um, we had to tip over and get back in them again. You know the normal drills you go through with these kind of things. Anyway, we did that, and then the order came through. The warning order came through. This is we didn't know we were going to attack this bridge, by the way. Um, we were just practicing with these canoes. Then it came through. The warning order came through. And we started preparing and practicing for the op. Um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of my friends in the record group and all of us, um, we know we were on the operation, but the details and the finery remembering this operation are very, very vague. But it goes along these lines. Um, we deployed from a, a CSI house on the southern bank of the Kavanga River, um, where Justin Taylor was, <clears throat> he was manning the radios. And there were a couple of clippers involved. Uh, there was obviously the bridge blowing teams, which was Willem Rata and a guy called Manuel Kaspar. Manuel Kaspar was a, was a, DEMS, a so called DEMS expert from the Portuguese army, and he joined the recce group. He was a lacquer guy. Um, but a shame, he had a few incidents, unfortunate incidents that happened to him. But anyway, Kaspar was with, with Willem. They were the guys that were going to lay the dems because they had the training in this. Willem obviously did it at, at, at um, SAS in Rhodesia. Manuel obviously did it in, in Portugal, whatever it was. And then there were, myself and Daisy were going to be um, the support for Willem and Kaspar and carry the extra explosives, the PE4 that was used to, to blow the bridge and the safety fuses and the debts and all that stuff. And then um, Kevin uh, Sido and, and his team member, whoever it was, and another one or two Kleppers, I think Peter Lippman was one of them, if I remember correctly. Was, yeah, Peter Lippman was there and I don't know if it was Oppies or whoever it was, but there were a couple of other Kleppers on that operation. We dispersed from this little house along the side of the river, the CSI house, and we and uh, Lieutenant Tians Mare took us with a with a zodiac up the river, where we disembarked. Then he turned around and came back, and we walked for a while up along the river to a point where we assembled our clippers, got into them, and started paddling up up the river to get to the target. Um, we got there very late in the night, obviously, and Kevin Sido and the crew, that were the protection crew, uh, split from us, and we went, we went on towards the target where Willem and Manuel started laying the dams on the pylons that, that they had identified to drop the bridge. Uh, we don't we cannot recall what the initiate what the what the initiation of, of, of the blowing was, but we it wasn't command detonated, so we suspect or we think that it was a fuse that it was um, safety fuse detonated, which would have given us enough time to get away before. And that's basically the the, the story of the Derika bridge blowing. We we did it, um, and it was quite exciting. Um, the next day, I remember we on our exfiltration, we had to we had to lie on an on an island in this in the boiling boiling sun, without without much water, and the mozzies absolutely ate us to pieces. Well, they ate us to pieces that night as well. I mean, the mozzies were something else on that day. But in the day, they ate you just as badly as as it, as, it, as it, in the nighttime. And I remember that day lying in that hot sun, boiling to death and getting bitten by mozzies before we could exfiltrate back across to the, to the Southwest African border side. 
And that was um, that was the Rico, the bridge blowing up. Another operation which was an interesting op was um, in early Feb. Uh, there was an there was an operation called Drehook, and it involved um, two six man teams. Uh, Zulu Golf and um, Whiskey Romeo, which was um, Zach Garrett and um, Fulham Rata. And I was in um, Zulu Golf Stick, and the two IB of that was my friend Gavin Mon. He was a sergeant. And we had three other guys with uh, whose names, two, uh, three black troops whose names I cannot recall. Fulham Rata had, was uh, Whiskey Romeo, and I'm sure in his stick he had Peter Lipman, and he would have had Manuel Kaspar. Yeah, I did have Manuel Caspar because I remember he, he did. And anyway, we um, we were deployed by Chopper Willem to another area, Zach Star stick to another area. And with, as soon as we climbed out of the choppers, we hit we hit the contact with two Swapo guys. We shot one of them, and it was the first my first physical contact in terms of bullets flying. And yeah, I, it was also the first time that. I would have that I ever saw a dead human, you know, shot. So I walked up to the guy afterwards and I had a look and yeah, it was it was you know one of those things that, and I realized, boy, now I realize this is not a game anymore. This is serious stuff. Eh? A few days later, Philem and Zach joined sticks, and so now we were 12 men and we worked together. And we we worked a day or two. Uh, we ran into another contact of five of them, and we shot three of them. And there was vehicle movement that day up and down a road. We heard it. So we hit these five groups um, in the late afternoon, shot three of them. And shortly after that, we heard a vehicle coming, um, was it, was it coming south. No, it was, it was coming from the northerly direction. And we realized th this vehicle is moving up and down all the time. It's obviously delivering um, weapons, um, ammo or supplies to somebody. So <laughs> just before it was getting dark, Willem laid it, we laid in a medium, an, an immediate ambush alongside the road and waited. And lo and behold, it wasn't too much longer later, <clears throat> we heard the vehicle approaching us. And we heard it and we heard it. Gavin Mon, Said, uh, uh, told me to move, 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 move. So the main stick of guys were, were lying about 20 to 30 meters away from me. I was further away from them in a nice position on the, alongside the road, waiting for, the, for this Gary to come around the corner. And as it, uh, we heard it and I saw the headlights and then it, it came around the corner and I took aim with my RPG and it became immediately calm. There was no problem. And I shot the rocket off. The rocket went <clears throat> through the left-hand light of the vehicle, through the engine. I saw it catch, caught, caught, it caught on fire, and, and it went right through the driver. And this, this vehicle start, carried on, continued, continued coming with a whining noise to, towards us. And it stopped to the left of me. And I just remember discarding my RPG like this, grabbing my AK and starting, starting to shoot to where, the, to where, this, where this truck was. Um, of course, there was a lot of explosions and bangs going off at the time. And what it transpired was that this truck was carrying ammo and the rocket had caused some of the stuff to ignite and it was, it was starting to bang now and go mad. Um, I really thought that it was my end now. <laughs> I thought that these guys were shooting us to pieces. And um, I was more than pleased when Zach, uh, when uh, Gavin Mon started calling me, Rick, Rick, are you okay? Are you okay? And he came up and uh, you know, got, got me back to, the, back to the rest of them. And that was, um, yeah, that was three hook. You know, we were in the bush for so long. I'm just remembering bits and pieces and details of, of, of what we did, eh? An interesting thing happened to, to me um, just in that same time frame. <clears throat> um, it transpired that the RPG uh, was becoming a standard issue platoon weapon for the South African Defense Force. And 
it was only going to be really used uh, for the side troops that came to do border duty. It wasn't going to be taken back to South Africa at this at this early stage of its implementation. And um, uh, there was an order that came through to Omahoni. Now we'd finished ops a bit and we were back in Omahoni doing a bit of R&R &R and fixing our equipment and training and that sort of stuff. And an order came through from Rundu instructing staff Ron Gregory and myself to be at Rundu the next day. So we duly took the next vehicle back to Rundu and we arrived there. You know what was going on. When we arrived there, we were called into um, um, Commandant Pereira's office and he told us that we will be training all the SAR units on the use of the RPG. Um, and because it's you know becoming a standard platoon weapon. And we went and if, because there was a time frame on the training of this thing, um, they'd allocated a chopper to us. So whenever the course finished, we would tell, we would radio in, and then the chopper would come and pick us up and take us to, to the next location. So that was quite lucky. We didn't have to go by road, you know, in those long um, extended mine sweeping trips along, you know, Wombilis of Vipat and all that. We just flew from wherever. So that was quite lucky. But we went to bases like in Congo, Ilundu, Inana, Oshivelo. Uh, Oshivelo was the last base that we went to. And in fact, at one of the one of the bases that we that we finished our training, I bumped into my my old sergeant from infantry school, Sergeant Kruger. He was in the pub there, and I walked in after the lectures. Um, unfortunately, Staff Ron didn't drink; he only drank coke. So you know he, he would, you know, I'd have to get him a coke and I'd have a beer, you know. But anyway, I walked to the bar and I asked for a beer and a coke, and then this guy looked at me and he called my name out, and I didn't see him, and it was uh, it was my old sergeant from infantry school, GC. It was nice to see him again. And, you know, he was a sergeant, I was a corporal, but you know, there was a camaraderie there. You know, it was it was really nice uh, to see him again. Anyway, we we trained all these guys, and our last uh, port of call was a base called Oshivelo, and Oshivelo was also the home area of 61 Mech, and that's who we trained last. We trained 61 Mech on the use of the RPG last. And that training finished on a Friday afternoon. And then there was an aircraft going to take us, a boss book, to, back to Rundu. But one of the, uh, the Rattle commanders was taking a convoy of Rattles from there to Rundu. And he said to me, if I want, I, I would, you know, I was keen to see go on one of these. And so he said, no, I can come with, I can jump on them and, and he'll show, show me what the rattles. Yes, I'm so glad I did that, take course. Because I rode with them all the way from Oshivelo up to up to Rundu. And what an experience. These, these guys really went out of their way to show me how the, how this what this machine could do. Incredible. Absolutely awesome, incredible machine. Anyway, that's how I got back to uh, back to Rundu. There were so many operations that we did, and the, the one I remember it was it was a it was a, a terrible op. Um, it ended up in a, being a big lemon. It was called um, Operation Okitali Kongwe. Okitali Kongwe was an area north, fairly north in into Angola, where they suspected a big um, concentration of Swapo, and these Swapo terrorists had become clever. They didn't congregate in one base. They formed little bases all over the show in one big area. And we, 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 we flew from, um, we flew from uh, Omahoni late one afternoon to um, Inana. And we hung around there for a while. After it got dark, we changed it into our cami uniforms. And then um, I remember there was there was some parliamentarian man that came to us and spoke to us, and there was a woman there that said a prayer for us. And yes, like I thought to myself, yes, you man, am, am I coming back? I don't, we didn't we didn't quite know what it was all about. But it was it was scary to have the woman pray for us. We, we thought, no, this is the end now. But anyway, we we boarded the Puma and we flew. It was a night flight, and the the, the flight engineer. Had a five-eye browning <clears throat> in the door, 
and at every single fire that we flew over, he would he would let rip with this with this um, browning. You'd see the traces going into the you know towards the fire. And um, anyway, that they dropped us that evening, and we did our normal drills, and then we did the dog leg, and we went into a temporary base for the night. But anyway, it turned out that the choppers had dropped us 30 kilometers north of where we should have been dropped. And, <laughs> and the, the, we, we had no idea where we were. Willem, and I mean, Willem was a good map reader. He couldn't read a map. Uh, he, he could identify where he was really an unbelievable navigator. Anyway, we couldn't find out where we were. And we walked around in, in you know, knowing, not knowing where we are. And eventually, we had to call in the imps. And the imps came in and we heard them flying south of us, south of us, flying. flying. And Willem brought them in closer and closer and closer. And eventually, we heliographed them and they spotted us. And they gave us a, our, our six grid, grid reference um, positioning. And we were, as I say, 30 kilometers to the north of where we should have been. So that night, guess what we did? We walked 30 kilometers back. <laughs> and I, I know the guys that were on that up will remember that night. <laughs> oh, it was something else. And then, yeah, it didn't turn out to be a very successful operation because um, you know, there, there was too much uh, air movement and these terrorists had picked up that there was something happening and they'd obviously scattered, you know, they'd moved off. Uh, of course, my, my last little story that I recall um, is Ops Protea. Um, Ops, <laughs> Ops Protea was um, a huge operation um, undertaken by the SADF at the time. Um, it was divided into different battle groups. And our battle group, I can't remember the name of it, but we, we, we our task was to, was to take Zangongo, a, a town in, in, uh, in Angola that was occupied by FAPLA and Cubans and Russians. Um, I wasn't with the companies, I was allocated I was sent to work with um, the Ford Air Controller designated to the battle group by special forces. And in fact, we turned, we, we ended up as, as very big friends. Um, a guy called Johnny de Gouvier. He was a, he, he won not Norwich crooks for bravery. He was an unbelievable soldier, but a great guy as well. And, and anyway, I was assigned to work with him. Um, <clears throat> on our way into, on our way into, um, to Zangongo, we, the, the, our battle group was pinned down by a 23 mil that was employed in the ground roll. So it would have shredded any vehicle that was coming its way. I mean, those it, ZPU, you got a ZPU two, a, a one, two, and a four. You know, they, 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 were, they were horrifying weapons. As you might know, they, they're not pleasant. And of course, this thing was firing at us and we, we, we just had to lay low where we were and I, I remember i mean i remember big daddy um instructing he was shouting the odds from the back because he was one of the commanders anyway johnny said rick come you gotta go and we we walked over the mount over the the, the mound that was hot the protecting us <coughs> and we snuck up close close as, as we could get to the position of this 23 mil anyway um i was only there to protect Johnny, to be his eyes and ears for any people that might come and you know, try and attack us. And Johnny brought in the Mirages that day. Unfortunately, the Mirages weren't hitting the, um, the target and they kept missing it. But you know, to be so close to this, this, this weapon and to have these powerful aircraft coming in and, and, and shooting, it was, it was an experience which I'll never forget, I was very lucky to have experienced that. We didn't hit the 23 mil, but anyway, it wasn't long after that, that um, the 23 mil was um, eliminated by, can you believe it, a Bosbok. A Bosbok came in and shot uh, a smoke rocket and it hit in a, a direct hit on the 23 mil and it neutralized it. And with that, we, we could advance and attack, and attack um, Zangongo. Um, that same operation, the last thing that I can really recall about that was, again, we were tasked with, <clears throat> with doing house clearing. And 
this was this was in the evening. Um, and Ronnie and I were working together, and we came up to a house to do the clearing. And there was a movement in in a, in a it was a neat little uh, house. Um, um, little flower. Uh, there was a, like a bush thing with flowers on it in the in the garden with a little pathway leading to the front door and a little wall in front of this house. And we approached, it was a low wall, we approached this house and there was movement in, in the bush there. So we both shot into it, pop, 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 and ducked behind the wall. And there was nothing. And we, we got up, opened the gate and went to look at the bush. And there was a, um, there was a, um, a fuffler guy that, we, that had been shot by, by Johnny lying in, you know, in this, he was hiding there. And it was the most amazing thing to see. It was the first time I've ever seen an AK jam. What he did was he cocked it. He cocked his weapon like this and he pulled back the work, he pulled back the working parts and let them go. And the working parts had scooped up sand and it didn't allow it to fire. And he, when, when we were approaching the gate, he obviously was uh, taking aim to shoot and we saw the movement. Anyway, that was the last thing that he saw. Anyway, we, we, <laughs> we got into that house and we found that it, it was, there was Russian stuff there. So obviously there were Russians and Cubans living in that house. They, the, the, there was a meal on the stove. You know, it was, it was quite amazing to, to, to come across these kind of things uh, during that operation. And certainly there, it, it was known that there were Cubans and Russians present at, that, at Zangongo Wall. You know, they must have just left before, just before we attacked, or they must have left while we were attacking the base when the 23 mil was holding us back. Of course, that's as far as that's as far as I go. I, I to be honest with you, I had many more operations, but I cannot remember them. I'm so sorry, but yeah, that's that's me. That's me. And thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity. I appreciate it. Well, Rick, we are very glad. We're very glad that you were that you yeah, I mean, it's it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask you one or two things, if you don't mind. Of course, please do. Um, yes. I remember on the first mission which you went over, you said you were running at night and you were doing anti-tracking. Yes. Can you perhaps just explain to the people here, what, what do you mean with anti-tracking? Um, okay, anti-tracking is um, when, you, when, you, when, when you try your best not to leave any tracks for the enemy to, to, to pick up on, to follow you. So for example, if you can, you would walk on wood, you know, on, on tree trunks, and um, you would walk on uh, thick clumps of, of grass, which will spring back again after you've left it. That's the kind of thing that you do when you anti-track. In other words, it, it, you try and conceal the way that you've, that you've moved through the bush and it works. Um, <laughs> It certainly works if you do it correctly. You've got to do it. It, it takes a lot of time, and you've got to do it carefully. But if you do it carefully, they they, they will battle to find you. And as as we can uh, prove, and uh, we 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 made it. They, they they never found us. So that's basically what anti-tracking is. They, that's what they taught us at um, minor tactics at um, at Buffalo before we became operators or or you know soldiers for three two battalion. That was one of the, the things they taught us. Have you ever had the fear of being captured? I think <clears throat> I think one, you know, when, when you're a <clears throat> when you're working in a small in a small team, there's always a little bit of fear uh, that you that you might you might get captured, um, or friends might get shot and you might get captured. But there isn't one real incident incident that I can think, yeah, I was un under threat of severely being captured. But certainly some of the ops we did, we were, you know, there was a, there was a worry that we could get captured, yeah. But luckily not to the extent where you thought, okay, I'm not going to see people for a long time, you know, no. No, luckily. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I'm, glad oh, to hear that. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed here because while you were talking, I was thinking to myself, well, wow, here's a guy who's been in the army, what, a year? And then he's into this elite unit, which you had to do your selection. And then you go on these adventures, on these missions, which, which in any other army, there would have been movies made of this. So I think the trust which they put into your people is just fantastic. 
at that age. You know, of course, it, <clears throat> it certainly it certainly was um, a privilege, uh, you know, to to have to have worked with 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 these guys. And I, and as you say, you know, the, the trust with which Commandant Ferreira um, held in us, you know, when he when he when he when he sent us on an operation, he knew we could we could do it. And and I think that 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 made it that made it all the easier to 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 complete it successfully because we wanted to do it. You know, there wasn't a case of no, we can't. It's too difficult. Da, 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 da. We 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 had to. You know, so yeah. Um, you know, it, it's um, when you first get there. Of course, I think Justin mentioned it in his um, in his talk when he said uh, when he arrived at 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 the at Rundu from South Africa. And he got out of the plane and he saw these folks standing there with cami braids. Um, it's a different unit, you know. Um, and you, 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 have to, you have to do the job. It's as simple as that. There's no such thing as failing. You, you have to do it. Um, and it, there's, there's, a, there's a spirit and a drive in the unit that everybody has. It's the same. It's the same. Um, the same drive. All the O's are are tuned into the same wavelength in terms of operations. You know, and um, no, it's awesome. Really, I was a privilege. It, it is awesome. It's awesome for me to to interview you people to talk to you. It's a great honor, even though many of you just laugh it off, you know. But really, it, it, it's it's it is fantastic. Now I have to ask you, Kevin Johnson. Yeah. Why is he referring to you as RPG? Where does that come from? Yeah, of course, you know, um, in the unit, a lot of us ended up getting nicknames. Um, like, <laughs> for example, um, Kevin's nickname was KD, and, and unfortunately, I, I can't uh, say what, what that stands for. <laughs> but Kevin knows exactly what it is. <laughs> my my name, I, I, I actually don't know. Of course, I can only I can only assume that it it came about a, as a result of me shooting that that vehicle out um, because it was the first vehicle that that the unit had ever annihilated and I, I suppose you know the story got back to the companies and then it was hey RPG Rick shot a, shot a jeep so that it became like a rhyme you know and and when I was injured and I got and I went back to Buffalo <coughs> um. That was my name, you know. A lot of us called me RPG. <laughs> it was just a, a nickname, I think. Because you know, I have no idea why it happened, but I'm. I think that is the reason. I think I love the weapon as well. Maybe that I love the RPG. <laughs> well, it, it's and everybody's got their favorite weapon. That's for sure. And it's army humor. I mean, we shouldn't ask too many questions why we call each other what they call it. It's done with love anyway. It's not done to. You know, to humiliate or anything like that. But what happened to you afterwards, Rick? Uh, now you finished the free to battalion. I think your two years are up, and you discharged from the army. You served honorably, but you're still a free to battalion member in, in a certain sense. You're entitled to that unique beret. You're entitled to your Ricky wing um, insignia. So, so what happens further to you? Do you come back to free to, or you? in a citizen force to do camps? Of course, um, I, <clears throat> I left, the, yeah, I left the, the military. I left, three, I clawed out of 3-2 and went back to City Street. And there was, there was certain little funny issues that I had, um, which my mom and dad didn't enjoy. Um, in other words, if if a door slammed, um, I would jump through the roof and I would be aggress I would be cross with it, you know, those kind of little tiny things. So <clears throat> my father very kindly sent me to America for a year. Um, he gave me a round ticket to the States, and I went and traveled America for a year where I, I calmed down a lot. I came back from America and I ended up getting a job. I worked for Rembrandt Tobacco as a promoter of cigarettes, much to my disgust. Anyway, <laughs> I don't smoke, by the way, anymore. I stopped long ago. 
Anyway, but I were, they, it was a good company. They looked after me. They paid us well. They sent me on a course to Fleur de Cup, which is near Stellenbosch. And there they bullshitted us by means of a doctor that smoking was actually good for you. It calmed down your nerves and it calmed you and it helped you to relax. And, this, and you know, of course, I'm sorry, but that's one thing about me. Eh? Don't do that to me. Sorry. And I realized right then then, this is not a company that I can work for. So I'd been with him for 18 months and I just couldn't anymore. I, I really, it's something that I, I, that shocked me to death. That, that, that was just terrible. Anyway, when I got back from this course, it wasn't long after that, I found my, myself a berth on a boat to, uh, to the Indian Ocean Islands. And I bought a share in a boat and I left the company and I went sailing for months. I went sailing into the Indian Ocean and I had a jewel. It was another jewel that I had. Um, I came back after eight, nine months of sailing back to South Africa and started looking for a, another job in that. And you must remember at that time, um, 83, the, the country was going through a serious recession. But I managed, fortunately, I managed to get a job with murderers and robbers. Murderers and robbers are Murray and Roberts. They building come up. They were a big building concern in South Africa. Uh, they, I had to go do a lot of aptitude tests and they, uh, they um, enrolled me as a student quantity surveyor. And of course, because I was single and married, they sent me to Umtata, which is Helen gone in, in between Durban and Port Elizabeth in the middle of nowhere. And there, murderers and robbers were busy building police stations, jails, universities, hotels and everything for the Transkai, you know, the independent state of Transkai. Lo and behold, when I get there, who do I bump into? One of my three two mates, Nico Grunewald, the driver that was with us at Savati. Unbelievable, hey, how small the world is. <laughs> anyway, we, we, we once again together and we worked during the week and on Friday the Wild Coast and went fishing. And I was with murderers and robbers for 18 months. And then there was a big slump in building in, um, in the Transkai. They lost a lot of contracts. And of course, first in, like last in, first out. I lost my job. And I, was, I sat unemployed for, for a long while. And during that time, I realized, hang on, whoa. I've got to do some studying. This is nonsense. This I can't jump from job to job. So I applied to a to a chemical company uh, to join them as a as a junior rep. I had to do aptitude tests there again, and they it was Protea Chemicals. I joined a big company called Protea. I joined <coughs> them as a junior rep, and they put me through certain courses, chemical courses. And I did well. And on the grounds of that, I decided to study chemical engineering on a bursary through a university in the United States, um, Pennsylvania University, which is what I did. I spent four years working hard, not fishing anymore, and working on weekends and working on nights. And yeah, I passed my degree and I was fully employed by Protea. And I worked with them for 18 years. And at the age of 40, I decided that um, I needed to study an MBA because I wanted to be promoted. So I started studying again. And I, I finished that course and I realized I'm 40 and I'm white. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be promoted. So I realized I've got to go do something on my own. It was the best move I ever did. I left. I, I, I removed myself from Protea Chemicals from the company. I, of course, I had all sorts of unbelievable restraints of trade against me. Um, I wasn't allowed to deal in chemicals for five years and all these things. And, you know, in hindsight, if I'd known what a lot of my friends had done after they resigned, because 
They lost a lot of people after I resigned, not because I resigned, but things changed in the company. Omnia Chemicals bought over the company and it changed and it became different, uh, you know, a different culture. So I was very fortunate that I resigned when I did, but um, yeah, you know, you've got to go sideways to move forward sometimes. And, and that's what I did. And I've never looked back since. Was <laughs> that's me after after um, after the army I, oh, um, I I did do I did work with the military after the army I was never ever called up as it were for border camps I think you know if I'd had to have gone to any other unit it would have been a complete um, um what's what's the word I want um, a complete disappointment I mean nothing would ever ever have matched or even come near C2 battalion with the exception of special forces. Well, internet, we've come to the end of this, of this episode. I say I find it fascinating, and I'm sure you people did too. If you have any questions for Rick, please leave them, leave them below here. We'll try to answer you. And Rick, I'm sure we will have a lot of questions, and I am planning to do a Ricky Wing uh, special as well, where we have a different members. Uh, we're getting them together. And until we meet again, God bless. Thank you, Chris.